this is Mike Connell from Enthought. Thanks for joining us today uh, for the Pandas Mastery Workshop walkthrough. So our agenda for this session is we'll spend just a few minutes. I'll tell you about who Enthought is and what we do, for those of you who aren't familiar with everything we do. And then I'll set us up with a little bit of an overview of how we approach training, this idea of training with the brain in mind. Um, my background is in learning science and artificial intelligence. And the idea here is that we take insights from brain sciences and cognitive sciences about how people learn, and we use that to design more effective training. So I'll give you a little bit of framework there to uh, give us a way to think about when we do the walkthrough, how the design is uh, put together to, to do what it's meant to do. And then we'll jump into the walkthrough with a, a Pandas Mastery Workshop, and, um, and then we'll, whatever time is left, we'll use for Q&A. So my, my colleague, Courtney Gottschall, our Vice President of uh, Marketing, is going to be fielding your questions if you want to type them into the question box. Uh, during the talk, and then she can answer what uh, she can answer immediately, and uh, she'll batch up the others so we can have those in the Q&A period. And everyone who registered for this webinar will also get a link to the recording. All right, so who are we? What do we do? NPOT is a global leader in scientific and analytic computing. We've been doing that for over 15 years, and we primarily work uh, with the Python stack as our tool set. And the reason for that is, there, there are many reasons for that. It's a great language for doing science and engineering as well as software uh, engineering. Um, and, but Python just really allows us to help people do their innovation and their, and their science uh, faster. You can, you can produce software a lot faster than in some other languages. And so we do consulting, um, where we work with customers to help you know, develop tools that they need for their workflows. We also do training. Um, in Python, the Python tool stack, and then we have a software layer that we provide, which we use and we, um, and we make available for customers to use to build on top of. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And then we also provide support. So Python being open source, um, kind of like uh, Red Hat with Linux, a lot of enterprises don't want to have an in-house team that kind of quality controls and puts together their, their Python tools every time a new release comes out, and so we try to make that process just painless. Um, we have a large user base. Over a million people have downloaded our software products. And uh, we're headquartered in Austin, Texas in the US, and we have additional offices in the UK and in India. So briefly, I'll just tell you, I'll kind of just do a high level overview here. In consulting, we do a wide, we work in a wide range of industries, from finance and energy and aerospace, biotech, consumer packaged goods, and a whole bunch more. Um, and then we uh, also have in the software and support area, the goal with the software is really to, like I said, make the process of using Python, deploying it easy. So, you know, installing your packages in, the, in your environments, um, managing updates and dependencies, the way, all the way through kind of tools for importing your data and, um, and then doing your development and analysis, um, as well as uh, deployment. So if you want to get your packages or, or applications out to your team or somebody else, we have tools for all that. And the, the idea is just to make it seamless. You don't have to deal with any of the underlying complexity. Um, and then we also have some open source and some pr proprietary libraries on top of that that we use to really do rapid development. Um, and that's what we use in a lot of our consulting um, engagements. And then in training, we do a lot of corporate on-site training. So if you have a team or a lot of people who need to get up to speed on Python or a specific tool set that we teach, um, we go on-site and teach at your company. We also have open classes. If you're an individual, that would be appropriate for you. It's open registration. Um, and if you're a small team within a company and you don't have enough uh, team members who want to take the training all at once, you can talk to us and we can sometimes anchor an open class near you to make that uh, work. Uh, we do do a lot of training in the U.S., Canada, Europe, and then we deliver it. We have an online training library that's called Enthought Training on Demand. We do some live over the internet virtual training, our Pandas virtual crash courses, uh, the main one there right now. And then we do mostly on-site live training, and that's the gold standard for learning effectiveness. And really our focus is the Python core tool stack, so the Python language, NumPy for array computing, Matplotlib for um, plotting and, and graphing, visualization, um, and then we kind of vary the scope and the content for different roles. So scientists and engineers often are building 
kind of simulations or some kinds of applications with graphical user interfaces. So that is a, one set of tools for them. Data scientists really need to know about the machine learning tools and, and the other tools of data science and Python, so that focuses on that. And then the other two go together here. So we'll talk about the Pandas Mastery Workshop, and that's really for anyone who wants to do data analysis in, um, in Python. Uh, uh, mostly, we'll talk about that. And then the Python for data analysis uh, is the Pandas Mastery Workshop for people who don't yet have the Python prerequisite. So if you don't know Python or NumPy or Matplotlib, you would come to the Python for data analysis. If you already have the prereqs and the language and those tools, then you would just come straight in to the three-day Pandas Mastery Workshop. All right, so let's talk briefly about what we mean here by training with the brain in mind. Um, like I said, my background is in learning science and so in education. And um, uh, so people have different ways of thinking about education and training. And so I'm using education as kind of the umbrella term here, and training you can think of as a specific kind of education. And a lot of people think that education is like filling a pail. So you've got a novice who doesn't know you know, much about the domain and you have some expert knowledge that you want to uh, basically transfer to them. And so it's kind of this idea of you're just trying to get the information in their heads somehow. And some people reject this metaphor, you know, the literal metaphor, but they, it's not the literal metaphor, they, they reject this metaphor of a pail, but then they use something like, well, it's more like a hard drive or it's more like a VCR or it's more like a filing cabinet. And all of those are essentially the same pail metaphor, just in different clothing. So other people, have said, well, no, education is not the filling of a pail. And Yates has a famous quote that people in education really like. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And the idea there is that, well, part of what the pail metaphor leaves out is this idea of engagement and motivation. And, and the idea here is you really need to get people excited about the knowledge domain of the, you know, whatever they're trying to learn, and then they'll kind of absorb it and they'll pull it in. So that's an important dimension to remember. But basically, these, both of these metaphors are inadequate for what we want to do. Either one of them really serves well as a guide to either designing instruction or to um, selecting, evaluating instruction if you're looking for some kind of training. So I would offer you that, uh, a, a different metaphor of the Rube Goldberg device. And I'll explain this. But basically, the idea is that education and training are really a form of engineering knowledge. You're trying to build knowledge structures of very specific sort. And so the reason the, the Rube Goldberg device, one shown here, which I'll walk you through in a second, is a good metaphor is because it's, it's constructed out of a lot of different kinds of components that are available at hand in order to solve a very specific kind of task. So in this case, this is a guy, and this is a, na it's a, a self-operating napkin. He lifts his spoon at A, it triggers the catapult that, that launches a cracker, which the parrot catches that tilts the teeter-totter, which dumps the stuff in G into the pail in H, which tilts the other teeter-totter, which lights the lighter, which lights the fuse, which launches the rocket, which cuts the string, which frees the pendulum, and that swings by and wipes his mouth. So it's a very kind of complicated, uh, a nuanced design to get something done. So how does that relate to learning? Well, if you think about, so let's pick a, something that's got a visual element to it, like you're, you're, you're trying to design a circuit or something like that. And and the expert circuit designer knows the problem space. They kind of have a vision of the solution they're looking to build. They can see the components, right, the transistors and the resistors and things. And they can, um, when they try something, so then they take action based on what they're trying to do and what they see. Um, and, and based on what happens, they kind of loop back and iterate. But some, you weren't born with these kinds of expert skills, right? Something must mediate between them. And what I'm proposing is a good metaphor is to think of your brain as kind of containing a whole bunch of these Rube Goldberg devices that are specialized to different tasks. So to give you a very concrete example, think of a video game like Tetris. And this is a scan of somebody's brain. Uh, the one on the left is their naive brain. So they've never seen Tetris before, and they come up and they start playing, and we scan their brain. And what you can see, the red and yellow and orange areas are kind of the areas of most activation. There's a lot of, these are the perceptual networks down here. There's a lot of visual patterns that are being activated, and there's a lot of motor, potential motor activities that are being activated, and then a bunch of other stuff too. So it's as, it's in a way, it's the brain kind of activating a whole bunch of stuff because it doesn't know what it needs, and then it's doing essentially a parallel search through a whole bunch of stored representations to figure out what it needs to build its little machine. And after an hour of practice, that's what's shown on the right, you can see everything's cooled off except for one yellow point, which is kind of the control center for that Rube Goldberg device. This is a specialized neural kind of machine dedicated to playing Tetris. 
So it's a very good metaphor, I think. It actually kind of captures what's happening. Now, in, and so you can think of, you know, we can't actually go in and, and, you know, we can't go in and engineer the neural connections in our brains or nervous systems. But we do know something about what's inside the box that we can use to inform the instructional design. And the idea of instructional design is we have to engineer, like I said, the knowledge. And so that means, um, you know, what activities are we going to select when? How are we going to sequence the information? How are we going to format it and present it? How are we going to use graphics? All of that is part of the design, which has a huge impact on not only how efficient you can teach something or somebody can learn something, but also how effective it's going to be at the end of the day, what they walk away with. So I already pointed out we have perceptual networks. This is an expert, right? And we're looking inside their brain at what connects what they see to how they respond to it. Perceptual networks, we also have motor networks. Those are what control your behaviors in the world. And in between there, we have a lot of different kinds of knowledge structures. We have concepts, and those are the kinds of things you might find in a reference manual or a dictionary. And you get those mostly from lectures, usually. Um, that's what lectures are good at, is actually conveying concepts. There are also skills, and those are stored in different parts of the brain, different kinds of networks. And you um, usually those are sort of developed by applying the skill poorly at first and better over time, like Tetris. Um, and so through the exercise of that skill is how you develop those networks. And then there's another kind of knowledge, which is called conditionalized or conditional knowledge. And the idea here is, for example, if you're an expert at tennis um, and you learn to play completely on asphalt and then you go play on grass for the first time, the skills and concepts of tennis remain the same, but the context has changed and you're going to have to adapt how you apply what you know, how you apply that expertise for a different context. You know, in programming, it might be something like, you know how to write programs, but all of a sudden you have to deal with a massive data set for the first time. And when you deal with big data, you have to actually use different algorithms and you have to make different choices about data structures and things like that. And so um, your concepts and skills that you already know have to be conditionalized and you have to re-assemble kind of assemble, uh, new ways of working with that. So usually conditional knowledge is developed over many, many years um, through trial and error learning on the job or, you know, whatever, doing the thing. Um, it's the school of hard knocks, basically. But we can accelerate that somewhat through projects and especially with mentor, if, you know, an apprenticeship or having a mentor or somebody expert there to guide you and point out the gotchas and explain to you what's gone wrong. That's much faster than having to figure it out yourself. Okay, so it's not just either about sort of conveying these types of information as if we have three or four buckets now. We actually have to very, in a nuanced way, we have to architect you could think of this as kind of a circuit, you know. We have to figure out how to architect that through our instructional design. All right, so with that framing, let's talk about the actual workshop. So this is the Pandas Mastery Workshop. It's three days long. It's, um, it's fo focused on pandas and data analysis. Who it's for is really, and I'll explain this a little more in a couple slides, but anyone who needs tools for data analysis and wants to use Python. Pandas is kind of the entry point for anyone who's doing inter active data analysis. Um, if you're doing large-scale automated simulations that just run, and then um, you might work with the, the output data in Pandas, um, but mostly anyone who's kind of working with tabular data that you might see in Excel or, you know, R or SAS or anything like that. Um, and a lot of people who use it are quantitative analysts, data scientists, business analysts, and the like. Um, all right. Okay, so for those of you who may not be as familiar with Python or Pandas, let me just give a brief overview of that. So why Python? Like I said before, Python's a great language for uh, engineering and scientific computing and analysis, as well as for software engineering. And that comprehensiveness and the flexibility is part of the reason it's been the most popular language for the last five years um, and going strong. It, it also plays well with other languages. So if you have legacy code in C or Fortran, you can wrap it and you can get to it from Python, so you don't have to be kind of moving between tools or languages. Um, it's also got a comprehensive set of scientific libraries, a NumPy for, for kind of concise, fast uh, array computing. It's got a nice, concise syntax. Netplotlib for publication quality uh, plots and graphs. And then a whole bunch of special purpose packages. For example, stats models for linear regression, scikit-learn for machine learning. So there's a huge number of these, and these are some of the most popular ones. And then if you get hyper-specific, there are packages for you know, chemical dynamics and, and modeling biological structures and things. So that's Python. It's also open source, which is great, and it's got a very strong supportive community. So it's a really great language and community to work in. Um, Pandas is another package, and it, in, and it brings new capabilities. It makes the analysis of tabular data really easy. 
if you're from R or you've worked in Excel or anything like that, it introduces the data frame, data structure, and that's part of what makes it um, makes everything so much easier. Uh, so anyone coming from SAS or Excel or R, that's part of the reason those people have started migrating in droves to Python is because Pandas has now created a very comfortable place for them to, to apply what they already knew how to do in some ways. It also simplifies time series analysis, so that's something that wasn't handled well before. But beyond that, one of the things that, that you deal with in an open source world is you know, you, you kind of put together a whole bunch of different tools from different providers and the APIs and the syntax are slightly different and the logic of them are slightly different. And so, you know, you're dealing with loading files in NumPy in one way and you might be loading files in another. You need a special purpose format. You have to go get that package. So Pandas has done a great job, the Pandas creators have, of bringing together a lot of the tools and wrapping them so that they're in a unified API within Pandas. You don't have to deal with all those. So, for example, they've got, you know, a dozen or so uh, loading functions for I.O., loading different specialized file types, and that's all seamless and it's got a uniform API and they've they basically hidden all that complexity from you. So, and the whole workflow of kind of cleaning and preparing your data, doing some initial analysis, exploratory analysis, all of that can be done right within Pandas. You don't have to jump between a whole bunch of different packages. And then they've made it really easy if you need the power of Matplotlib beyond the basic plotting that Pandas provides for you. Um, you can easily pass your data structure in there and into Matplotlib and get, um, get the plots that you need. So it's made it really seamless and easy. So really the reason we have dedicated a class to Pandas specifically um, first as opposed to other packages is because it's really the portal for people who want to do data analysis in Python. And really it creates a very comfortable cockpit where you can get access to all the other um, stuff that you need within the ecosystem. Okay, so Let's talk about a couple, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of design principles that are grounded in learning science and then just kind of examples of how we connect those to, to you know, design and practice. So in learning science, one of the things we find is that learning takes time. And, and this actually surprises a lot of people. So one set of studies, for example, looked at how long does it take someone to make sense of, to semanticize, extract the meaning from a slide, a PowerPoint slide. And let's say it takes 10 seconds. And then they studied kind of what instructors do, and often they'll, they'll fly through slides at seven seconds each. And what you end up with is you get a wash of information which the brain doesn't have time to latch and extract. And so you, you end up kind of just feeling dizzy but not really having retained much. So we have to respect this. This is a biological constraint that we have to, we have to take very seriously. And uh, if we're not aware of it, we can't take it seriously. On the other end of the spectrum, we have um, evidence that it takes about 10,000 hours to become an expert in programming or you know, um, playing an instrument or chess or any complex domain. Uh, so you know, we have to be reasonable about what we can expect to achieve in an hour or a day or a week. Um, and you know, we really want to make the best use of that time. In fact, there's good evidence that you can swing things like there was one case example where three years of on-the-job training you applying learning, learning science principles, we were, we were able to compress three years of on-the-job training in circuit uh, debugging into 25 hours of focused training, cognitive training. So the swing can be huge. I mean, there can be a huge difference between well-designed and, uh, and just kind of average design. Second learning principle is that learning is hierarchical. It, 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 and this is, this is kind of where the pale metaphor really falls down is that, as I've shown over here in this picture, you have kind of a baseline of concepts and then the skills have to hang off of that and then you know higher level things like judgment and that conditional knowledge have to hang off of concepts and skills and it's it's not at all like a pale it's much more like a hierarchy and these different types of knowledge structures right concepts and skills are two different types of knowledge structures they require different types of instructional design different kinds of activities like lectures versus hands-on exercises and they require different amounts of learning time Okay, so those are the learning science principles. What can we do with that? Well, the learning takes time principle tells us there are absolute limits on how much a human being can absorb in a fixed amount of time. It varies by person, but it doesn't vary by an order of magnitude. It varies at best by one and a half times, you know, in an average group. So um, there are absolutely, if you give people an hour to learn and you try to give them a thousand concepts, um, what happens is at some point you cross a threshold and it's not the case that, hey, let's just jam as much in as we can and people will, that way we'll ensure that people get the most out that they can and they'll just kind of leave the rest behind. That's not what happens. If you, you cross that threshold and now it becomes death by PowerPoint and the brain doesn't have time to internalize any of it. And so the more you start pushing in, the less learning you actually start getting out. 
this is a very, very serious constraint that's almost always abused and ignored. Um, because there's pressure, right, to do more in less time. And so this is just a kind of a pushback to that saying, that's not how you're going to get the best learning. And similarly, in fixed time, there's, there's a trade-off between scope of content and the depth of learning. So if you, if you really want someone to walk away being able to apply what they learned in a training uh, the next day, you've got to spend time you know, working on skills and, and high, transferable skills, basically. And so that means you might, you know, if you had, we're going to cover 10 concepts in an hour, uh, just concepts in a lecture, if you want exercises, you might have to cut that down to three or four. And if you want to actually work on some kind of judgment, you might only be able to do one in that same hour. So th this is the trade-off, is, you know, breadth of content is traded off against depth of learning. And so, you know, if you've had the experience of going to a training or, you know, a day of lectures or something and going back to work, you feel like you got a lot, you feel like your head is full, and then you sit down to work and you realize, I don't know how to get started, or I sort of generally know what the ideas are, but I don't know how to apply them to solve my problem. That's because now you're back at work and now you've got to do all of that learning to build the rest of the hierarchy that you didn't do in the training. So you're going to pay for it somewhere, right? If you don't do it in the training with instructor support and good design where it's very efficient, you're going to do it inefficiently back at work, typically, over time. School of hard knocks again, right? You'll get trial and error. Okay, so the, the other design principle that comes out of the hierarchy is that the hierarchical um, learning uh, point is that we need to match the type of activity to the types of learning outcomes that we want. For example, it's intuitively obvious to people that you can't learn to ride a bike by watching a lecture on riding a bike, right? You actually have to get up and fall down and stuff. Okay, so let's look at the class now. So with that in mind, our overarching learning objective here for this course is for the participants to get back to work on Monday morning and to be able to actually apply what they learned in the class, not to have to flounder around for a couple of days to get oriented. Um, so to apply that capability immediately. We're looking at a capability kind of the, the, t the tip of the um, hierarchy. So capability, you know, has a lot of things that, that make, it, make it work, including skills. It's not the only thing. Um, and so one capability might encompass a bunch of skills, and then under that is a whole bunch of concepts. So this is the hierarchy we're looking to build. Um, and, you know, it, it generally looks like this, is there's a lot of concepts that support a few skills that support a capability. Okay, so let's start at the bottom and, and work up, and I'll give you, this is the peek under the hood, I'll show you kind of how we design stuff and what the materials and experience look like. So there's a bunch of concepts. I'm going to show you a set of concepts that all kind of hang together around the pandas data frame, which is that central data structure. So one of the things we want to do is we don't want to just blast a whole bunch of facts at people and concepts that are unrelated. We want to first give them an advanced organizer so that when we start to teach them things, they have a place to put it and they have a way to relate all the information to each other. And so um, what we start out with is this definition, right? It's useful to think of the data frame in terms of its components. And so we give you this mental model and we spend a little bit of time on that. And then we jump and we show you how to create one of these things. Okay, so now you know what it is. And now when we show you how to create it, we're going to highlight, hey, look, here's where you build this part, which we told you about. Here's where you build this part. And then we'll show you a few different ways of building it. Now, you know, there are a bunch of ways to create a data frame, and we haven't given you, we're not going to exhaustively enumerate all of them, because the point is, first we want to curate the ones that we think are most important for most people most of the time, right? That's the 20% of the material that you'll need 80% of the time. That's a place where you get huge efficiencies. And by combining that with keep laying down the mental models and the foundational knowledge that you need to actually understand what's being talked about instead of just memorizing a whole bunch of recipes, when you need to go out and find your fifth one about how to create one for your project, um, it'll be easy. It'll be just a little incremental annotation on what you already know because you have this foundation of, of conceptual understanding. And then the other two nice things are this is curated, highly curated, over many, many you know, um, times teaching, but it's also all executable. So these could be little recipes for, for people to take back and use as a kind of starter library for when they need to write their own programs. This all runs this code. And the other thing is that we encourage participants to type along, type this stuff in when you're going through the lecture and try stuff out, you know, make mistakes, ask questions about that. So it makes it interactive even in the lectures and it also generates a lot of good questions because people run into funny cases when they're playing around and those are great questions for the instructor to, to discuss with them. And also increases engagement. All right, so, you know, similarly, this is another set of concepts around the attributes of the data frame, but again, we've curated the set. And I just wanted to highlight that we, we pull through. We've already given you this mental model, and now we're going to keep that to be the organizer throughout. And you'll see it on different slides here. Here it is again, right? 
we don't have any extraneous graphics just to add fun. We use the graphics for learning and, and kind of minimally because they can be overloading if there's too much. Okay, so that's kind of how we introduce some of those concepts. But then there are also, there's kind of the expert judgment. And we know what, not, what novices are going to run into a lot of times, what the main problems are going to be. So, for example, the, there's a lot of different ways to do indexing in pandas. And so we explain all the different ways, but we also say, okay, look, there are some ambiguities here in the language, and here's why they exist, and here's what to look out for. And there's some, you know, inconsistencies. This little note down here tells you what to look out for. And then we also tell you how to use all the different variations. And so this is a way of saying, look, we're going to walk you through this in a way that we think will get you there fastest and give you all the options so that you're aware of them and kind of able to use them. But we'll also, on this next slide we show, we'll also make a recommendation. So down here we kind of recommend, look, this is the easiest way most of the time to do it. So just to give you a sense of kind of how we think about sculpting the information to be really efficient and effective. All right, so it's, it would be way too much to go over all the concepts in the class. Uh, you should see our pandas cheat sheets for the representative list of concepts that are covered in the course. There's not a one-to-one -one correspondence precisely between um, concepts in the cheat sheet and things in the class. They were designed to go along with the class we've put a few extra little tidbits in the cheat sheets. But the idea is that if you take the class and you walk away, you should be able to use anything on the cheat sheet either immediately or with a minor amount of kind of, uh, you know, Googling the documents to look at, um, to look at, to, to look up whatever it is that's not clear to you. So this is a really good representation of the scope of the class. It was designed as a, as a learning aid for the class, as a job aid to take away from the class. So it's really tightly, uh, tightly connected to that and it's a great, way to get a sense of the content. So just to show you, you know, there's eight of these pages, um, pretty beautifully designed by our team. And, um, and you know, it's again that 20-80 rules. We're giving you the 20% of the information that we think you'll use 80% of the time. So when we're looking, for example, at um, loading data, you know, we focus on the read table method, the biggest method, and we show you a couple variations like read clipboard, and we show you the main we show you the main arguments and a few others, but not all of them exhaustively, because it's really designed to be usable, like the whole training. All right, so that's that. Here's the link. If you didn't get the uh, worksheets, you should download them and feel free to share them widely, print them out, hang them by your desk. You'll be the envy of your wing of the <laughs> office. All right, so all right, so that's concepts. On top of that is skills. So concepts kind of roll up into skills, um, and the way we've designed the class. So again, there are many little design choices that we made to support the transferable learning and um, and kind of this layered reinforcement from concepts up to um, you know judgment. So if you think about data analysis, it's got to kind of you know the big loop on the outside is I've got to find my data, load it, I've got to visualize and look at it, I have to prepare it, clean it, I have to analyze and model it. And then at each of those steps I might loop back any number of times to any number of previous steps. And then I save it and that takes me from my research question down to my answer. And so we've laid out the sequence in the course to match this so that it is kind of like one, one iteration through the um, loop, through this workflow loop. And so these are the skill buckets. Loading data is a skill or a, skill, a set of skills. And so we kind of not only teach you the syntax, but you get to try it and, and figure out like, well, geez, how do I handle these different kind of idiosyncratic data formats and, and separators and stuff? So we'll give you um, chances to do that. So that's the skill. Visualization has a bunch of different components, right? There's not just visualizing, but there's you have to look at the data types. You have to look at missing data. You have to validate your data. So we talk about how do we use the tools to get that part of the workflow done. Preparing data, analyzing and modeling, and then you know saving it out. Um, and so the way we do that is with what we call finger exercises. So often people focus on the content and they typically focus on the lectures as the vehicle for the content. But the lectures are really secondary, as I was saying, is lectures kind of give you a momentary sort of view on things, but they don't, it's not a great way to learn stuff and, and take a lot of stuff away. So we think of the, these finger exercises, which means a small, very focused exercise. It's very focused on a concept as opposed to a big integrative exercise that might, you know, pull a bunch of ideas together. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so we do a concept like um, reading data, and then we do some finger exercises on it. And so, you know, it's like, look, we just gave you a file name here, and we want you to load that data. And so you just learned about, you just learned, this is an IPython notebook, so we, we give you the setup, and then you kind of do what we ask you, 
And um, so it's, it's highly interactive. I'm just going to show you real quick so you can kind of get a feel. So, you know, this might be my first attempt is, well, what if I just try to read it in? And, okay, that looks pretty good, but it's not quite right because there's, you know, these aren't split up the way they're supposed to be. So I can work, I can work, I can work on that until I think I've got it right, and then I can check the solution. And at one level I can say, that doesn't look right, and so I go back and rework it. And at another level I might say, okay, I need some help, and I can actually look at the solution to debug my own misunderstanding. So, like I said, and then there are hints sometimes. We, because we want this to be surgically focused, we might say, all right, you know, here's a little extra something is you need to figure out how to do the column names because this file doesn't have them or whatever. But we don't want you to get hung up on that because this is really about loading data. It's meant to be a finger exercise for loading data. So we'll give you a hint to give that away so that you don't get hung up on it. Okay, so we tried to, these are so important they're the backbone of the course, as far as I'm concerned, that we have a lot of these. They're kind of attached to every major concept in the class, I would say. Um, so that's uh, that. Okay, so then the third, so kind of we're more moving up the hierarchy, right? Um, so the third thing is now how do we build up to that judgment and kind of that top-level capability? Well, the thinking here is that part of what happens is if you go to a training and, and you get a lot of concepts and maybe a few exercises, but you don't, get, you don't actually have transferable knowledge, you get back to your desk and that first project becomes the rest of the training because you're going to, you, you, you have to sit down, you have to read the docs, you have to figure out how to apply what you learned, you have to relearn what you forgot. And so what we're doing is we bring in a project into this class and that's where you blow out the pipes and make all your mistakes and be confused, but, uh, but there's an instructor there and there's a well-designed, it's a real-world project around climate change and, you know, sea levels and temperatures and things. It's a real-world kind of project, but we've provided some structure and support so that, so that you can figure out how to close that gap on uh, how to apply these things to a project that's not, it, these aren't finger exercises anymore. These are real like, hey, look, you know, here's a data set. Why don't you load it and look at it, and then why don't you figure out if there's missing data, you know, and so on. Why don't you plot it? So it's kind of, you're now you're doing a real project that matches the, um, the workflow you're going to be doing back at work. Okay, so that's really the, the idea here is that you can see this design, it's the layout of the lectures and the finger exercises, it's the layout of the project, and that's how we're building up and helping facilitate the transfer back to work so that when you get back there you should be ready to go. All right, so just to summarize, um, learning science can really inform effective design a lot, and one of the insights from that is that there's this trade-off between coverage and depth. So you've got to pick. Do you want people to have transferable knowledge or do you want them to be superficially aware of, of you know, 10 times as much stuff? And when you're looking for training, you should be thinking about this. One's not right and one's not wrong. Uh, each one is right when it matches what your, what your business goals are and it's wrong when it doesn't match well. So that's the idea, is the idea of fit. And at some point, you know, you, you know, people always want more content in the same amount of time. That feels like good value, but I, but I have to tell you it's not. At some point you cross that threshold and more content means less learning. And if the learning is really what you're going for here, you're, you're, you're undermining your own best interests. Um, and then, of course, the instructional design should support the desired learning objectives. So the Pandas Mastery Workshop, which we just looked at, um, you know, the reason for Pandas being the focus is that that's really the control center for most people's analysis um, in the ways that I talked about. It's the portal. It's the entry point for, mo for, for just about anyone who wants to come in and, and start using Python for data analysis. Because even if you're doing machine learning, you've got to clean up and shape your data. And so Pandas is the right tool for that most of the time. Our top level goal for this particular workshop is that immediate Monday morning difference in capability. Right? We don't want you futzing around on Monday um, trying to figure out how to apply what you learned. You should have already done that. And what makes this different from other trainings options you might see around Pandas? The scope, I talked about how we curate it with the 2080 rule, where we, we try to provide you with the 20% of, of the knowledge that, that we have found through our own experience is 80% of the value, um, or that you'll use 80% of the time. The design, the fact that it's heavily informed by learning science is, is unusual um, in the world, uh, as far as I can tell. The depth of learning, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> I think we all want transferable skills, but um, a lot of Trainings just don't deliver that. We've put a lot of thought and effort into uh, doing that. And then the experience. I didn't really get into the learning science behind this, but there's this very interesting phenomenon that um, when things are uh, hard in the right way, it's hard fun. So it's not superfluous 
it's fun. It's not like vapid entertainment or we're adding, you know, dancing characters to make it engaging, even though it's really, you know, terrible. It, when people have this experience of being very engaged and that it's a very rewarding experience, and that's because it's effective. That's the brain's way of actually saying, hey, this is good information. Let's, let's sort of take it in. Um, so that's really what we're shooting for in the experience. And I think if we look at some of the participant feedback, it's been very, very strong uh, for this class. We've got 96% of people would recommend it to a friend. You know, and there's always that one person who's unhappy about the air conditioning situation, and so they ding you on the quality of the course. Um, you know, or it was just a bad fit for whatever reason, right? Um, so, so that's uh, that's a good indicator. And then a couple other things. It, you know, this is, this person says it was a great class to scale up in pandas. Great instructor, excellent course materials, definitely recommendable. So really, that is what we strive for: is the quality materials, quality design. We have amazing instructors, absolutely amazing instructors, and really trying to make it a solution uh, that that's well suited to the needs of our of our customers. Here's another one that says um, about kind of the efficacy. After going through this class and the data science class, I feel confident and prepared to tackle even the ugliest data sets around. Teachers are not very knowledgeable. They do a great job explaining tricky topics with ease and clarity. Highly recommend for anyone who's working with data. And then we often get a question about, you know, I already know some pandas. Is this going to be a waste of time? And what we find often, similarly with our Python training, is that Sometimes people self-study and they'll pick a book kind of at random and they learn Python, but they don't learn Python with that expertise layered in necessarily even specifically for the domain you know, of engineering science and analysis. They might just know the language and it might have been from a computer software engineering perspective. And so what we find is that what this, what this person said is I have decent experience with pandas, but I'm glad I took the course because some of the salties helped me understand more about how it works. And that's often what we find is like all of that nuanced kind of 80-20 curation and, and layered on with the, um, the kind of insights that we have about what to avoid and what to do, uh, people find of great value on top of what they already know. All right, so for you, next steps, if you're an individual who wants training, you should go see our open calendar. Um, if you have a group, you should talk with our Python training experts about options. You know, if you have around 15 people or so, then um, you can kind of do a corporate one, a corporate training. If you have a smaller number, you know, talk to us. We might be able to put an open training in your area and you could be the kind of the uh, core of, of that to make it work. Um, and remember to download and please do share the Pandas cheat sheets um, at that link there. All right, so right before, just before we get to the Q&A, um, I wanted to share with you the, the training calendar. And um, so these are our three different big courses. Scientists and engineers, like I said, is for people who are kind of doing engineering and simulation and that sort of thing. Some software craftsmanship, some how to build graphical user uh, interface elements rapidly for your analysis, interactive analysis, um, that kind of thing. Python for data science focuses more on the data science tools in Python and the Pandas Mastery Workshop is what we just did. And all of those, well, the first two, and then the Python for Data Analysis, which is the Pandas Mastery Workshop, plus the prereqs, they all cover the same core of language and NumPy and Matplotlib, so the core stack, uh, scientific stack. All right, with that, I think we should jump to questions in the remaining few minutes. So, Mike, we, we have just a couple uh, here that I've that I've pulled out that were, were common questions. So, uh, you you touched on it, but um, people did want to know specifically what the prerequisites are for the course. Uh, could you just enumerate those a little bit? Sure. So, for well, like I said, so we for the Pandas Mastery class, um, you need to know Python, and you need to know NumPy, and you need to have some experience with Matplotlib, the plotting package. Um, because we jump right into pandas and it assumes all of that. Uh, but if you don't have that, then you can take the exact same pandas, you know, module, the three-day module in the Python for data analysis, and all the prereqs are covered there. So there are no prereqs for that in terms of um, content knowledge. Pretty much for all of our classes, if you're extremely new to computing, the recommendation is that you you have had some experience, you know, with 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 uh, what would I say. Basically, um, programming concepts, you don't need to know how to write a loop in any particular language, but you should understand what a loop is. You should understand what a variable is. Um, we kind of jump in at a higher level than that, assuming that people are familiar with those concepts. Um, so, those okay, are. and 
And then we had another question about um, is this the class that you would is this the class that you would choose if you are working in finance or would you look at the Python for data science class? So which class would you recommend for somebody typically in, in the finance sector? So it depends a little bit on the, on the details of what you're doing, but Pandas was actually developed by, um, in the finance sector. I mean, that's why it has time series analysis, which is amazing. That's why it handles all these hetero, heterogeneous data, different data types you know, that need labels. It, 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 it's probably the tool that you're going to want to start with or, and maybe be the only tool depending on what you're doing. So, yeah, Pandas uh, definitely. Okay, and then uh, one question that I'll take real fast here. Someone was asking for the uh, Pandas cheat sheets that, that you were showing. Uh, do you have to register for the class for those? And the answer to that is no, they are completely free. All you need to do is uh, fill out the form that's on that page and they'll be sent directly to you via email. Hope that everybody enjoyed the, the webinar. Mike, thank you for the time and all the, the effort you put into um, putting together some really great material for folks here. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you, and we hope to see people in class.